AI as a term originated in 1956 in, in the US and was a joint effort by certain academics. Data science is a term that has been around since the 70s, but it really took off as a term around 15 years ago. And it's a term created for marketing purposes. So advancements played a key role in the development of data science. And these were primarily uh, the rise of the internet, worldwide, social media, cloud computing, cheaper storage, where essentially many companies found themselves collecting all sorts of data and having no idea what to do with it. Welcome to Mangtas Nation Season 2. This season is all about tech of the future. We'll be sharing real-world experiences and featuring astounding guests to help guide you in your tech journey. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Hello, everyone. This is Jackie DeMunk, together with Wouter Del Barre, and welcome to the Mangtas Nation podcast. In today's episode, we're thrilled to have on board a renowned data science veteran and tokenomics expert. With an impressive academic background in psychology, artificial intelligence, statistics, economics, and a PhD in computer science, he is a true polymath who has worked on various domains, including natural language processing, recommender systems, sports analytics, data culture, and neural networks. He is currently the CEO of Tesseract Academy, an organization that specializes in educating decision makers on deep technical topics like data science, AI, and blockchain. He also serves as the chief data scientist of Electi Consulting and as a chief data officer of Datalist, where he helps professionals become data scientists. Listeners, let us welcome a guest who is currently living and working in London, Dr. Stelianos Stelios Kampakis. Hey, Stelius, thank you for taking the time to join us today and welcome to the show. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. Now, um, well, Stelius, uh, it seems like, you know, after that lengthy introduction, we see and our listeners already hear that you're involved in so many things and, you know, we barely know <laughs> where to begin. But, well, probably the best uh, place to start would be to... Tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, and then we can branch out from there. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been in the space of data science and AI for about 10 years now, and uh, I think I've been in Web3 for the last six years now or so. Um, I've, I think I've, been a, I've done a, bit of, a little bit of everything in my career, so in terms of uh, technology, um, I've done, you know, from like deep learning, um, to like, statistical modeling, um, all the way to education. Um, in the last few years, I spent a considerable amount of my time uh, simplifying data science and either helping students become data scientists or executives and companies to better understand data science. I've also published two books, and there's going to be a third one coming out nice. this year <clears throat> about the history of data science, the last one that is. Uh, so very happy about that. And within Web3, I specialize in the area of tokenomics, as you quite accurately uh, mentioned. Um, and essentially, my, my own, let's say, my main expertise within data science is around uh, modeling, right? And uh, I was one of the first people to take token economics seriously as a field and apply certain methodologies for the analysis of token economies, like agent-based modeling. Um, and this is how one thing led to another. And then now these days I find myself spending half my time in uh, working on token economics. Um, so I guess I split my time in between a few different activities, like the Tesseract Academy, um, writing books, teaching, consulting for various companies. And I also recently joined Hakian, uh, which is it's a very big smart contracts auditing firm because um, they are starting a new division on tokenomics auditing. <coughs> Mm -hmm. which we believe is going to be the next big thing in tokenomics um, since we saw many uh, issues on like with FTX, Terra Luna crossing, uh, which means that the, the whole Web3 space, if they want to be taken more seriously, they need to start thinking about some kind of auditing and, and oversight. 
so that's like a brief overview. And at any given moment in time, I'm involved in a few uh, different things. Uh, and I just want to note now, uh, Data List has been renamed to Beyond Machine, in case anyone wants to um, look it up on Google. <laughs> because I won't find the, the previous data, the, the old website, I'll find like a new website. Just <laughs> what it We'll make sure to, to include it in the yeah. show notes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and, and maybe just taking a little bit of a step back right so so where did it all begin uh where are you from originally tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today including your interest in data science right what sparked that uh, yeah and why did you start to specialize in all of that yeah that's actually a very long story because i started on this journey around yeah. 2009 which now feels like a lifetime ago and it makes me feel a bit <laughs> old um, but <laughs> my, my initial <laughs> studies were in cognitive psychology. Uh, so I wasn't interested in the technology per se. I was mostly interested in the human mind. And um, towards the end of my studies, uh, I was doing one of those comprehensive degrees in, uh, back in Greece where you specialize in one thing, but you also have to do like other stuff as well. So where I'm going with this is I specialized in cognitive science, but also had to undergo some clinical practice, etc. I'm like, I'm not really sure this is for me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in the study of the human mind and intelligence and philosophy of mind. And then I decided to switch over to study exactly that, right? Um, so then I moved out of Greece. I went to the UK, did a master's in, in, in the University of Edinburgh. And I was pretty determined to become an academic. And this is when I moved from Scotland to, to London, to UCL. Um, and that was then... I realized that uh, maybe academia is a bit slow moving and while I was in the process of actually doing research, I'm like, you know, I probably overestimated the impact that academia has on the real world. Uh, that's not to say that there are not serious academics <laughs> out there, uh, but for better or for worse, and I hope I don't offend anyone there, uh, I think academics with a real impact on society are the minority, no matter what most people think. Uh, it's a bit like if you ask people how well they drive, the majority will, they will say they're, they're above average drivers, which <laughs> obviously <laughs> statistically doesn't <laughs> make any sense, right? Or and how well I pronounce your name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just above average, though. Uh, that wasn't just a compliment. Um, but that's when I, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be out of academia. I mean, I'm still affiliated with certain institutions like uh, UCL, London Business School, um, Cambridge, uh, and some others like the Cyprus International Institute of Management, but as an external, right, either uh, teaching or advising students, etc. And since then, I embarked on my own journey of uh, essentially trying to figure out, you know, wh what um, I can do with data science, right? So I was, and what I, and what I realized is that what I really like doing in terms of applying data science to real world problems is two things. Um, one is either helping startups to innovate and, or help organizations to, and se senior executives to better understand data science. And then a close third is helping people start a career in data science. I say close third because this is, has always been there for me, you know, since, because I've been teaching since university. And uh, then you might ask me why startups. So the thing with startups is that they're, I think they're always more exciting. So what I notice is that with, with bigger companies, I like educating decision Definitely makers, agree. talking with them. Yeah, but, but yeah, I mean, you see you run a startup, right? So you know what I'm talking about. But bigger companies are a bit slow moving. Um, so you have interesting conversations, but working with them in the actual implementation of, of the proposals can be it's quite different, right? It can be a bit slow. It's a bit of a slow process. It's, it's quite different. Mm -hmm. Where startups can be more dynamic, can be faster. You build more personal relationships. You meet people. So there's also this um, social aspect, uh, which I very much enjoy. So this pretty much sums up, you know, it's, it's a quick overview of my journey. There are some other aspects which probably I didn't expand too much upon, like uh, tokenomics or, you know, a prior... Um, interest in computational and neuroscience, uh, which um, unfortunately I don't really have the time to pursue this anymore. It's an interesting but very academic field. So many uh, things to learn and so little time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. This uh, knowledge keeps... Uh, sorry, just a note there. This is something I realized when I was in determined to become an academic. I was obsessed about learning. And now that I'm, most of my work is within the industry, I'm not doing, let's say, proper work per se uh, sorry i mean research or or anything like this but i'm 
like essentially applying the things I know, I realized that it's um, just so difficult to keep up with every new development. Um, and I think at the pace that um, we see everything progressing, I don't think it's possible for someone to know everything. And uh, I don't even... Yeah. It's crazy to think what's going to happen when new iterations of large language models like ChatGPT, they essentially reach a point where they can also produce their own research because, you know, one of their many weaknesses now is they can't really think in a logical way. They mm -hmm. fake logical thinking, but imagine if they can start writing their own proofs and all that. Um, it's, it's crazy. That's why in my work, um, I mean, I, I'm still trying to keep up, obviously, with recent developments, but what I find out, it most often comes down to applying the basics in a very thoughtful way rather than just trying to always look for the new shiny things unless there's a very good reason for you to do that. Um, it's like a general approach in, in how I solve um, problems. And we'd love to ask you a lot more, especially tokenomics, Web3 and all that. We definitely want to go down that path. But before we do, we noticed that you did a very interesting PhD mm -hmm. on a topic that we're very passionate about, which is footballers and injuries. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more? Because I've prob I could have probably been pro if I wasn't injured that much. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd love to understand that a little bit better. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's a funny story. Like, uh, I actually got a scholarship uh, to study this because I, I was admitted to UCL, and um, there were essentially four programs uh, I could choose from. They were like f because they they the university had arrangements with companies to fund students for particular areas, and essentially they told me, okay, you have a very good background, you know, you can choose any of them. So there was one like on retail analytics, or something else on. I don't remember, probably it was finance or something. Um, and uh, <laughs> there was this one that was funded by Tottenham Hotspur. And no one wanted to touch this uh, because most of the computer science PhDs, they never had anything to do with sports in their entire lives. Uh, so I'm a very bad uh, football player. It's probably also because of my... Um, you know, because of my body, right? If, if you see me more like a rugby player than an actual football player, even though if someone's listening from America, they'll be like, oh, you know, that's, that's the same thing. But <laughs> in Europe, they're not, you know? <laughs> no, so, no, no. So yeah, if, you're, if, you, if you're based in America, you know? And, uh, but I'm a fitness enthusiast. We'll put the differences in the show notes as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we we'll last chat GPT to summarize it. How about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's football, but you play it with your hands. Anyway, it's a bit confusing. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, but, but essentially, no one wanted to touch this, and I'm a fitness enthusiast, so I'm like, okay, because that's like a completely new area, maybe I can make a dent in that area. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go for this. Um, and I was working with the medical department. Um, in our main, we, we worked on two things predicting injuries or predicting how long it would take to recover from an injury. Um, what I can tell you is that this is actually possible, but there were many real world challenges which made me abandon that area. Um, and essentially the problem is that in order to do this successfully, you need very good data collection. And in order to do this uh, in a team, especially with professional players, um, you need to have the right culture, the right mindset. Uh, so you really need to have the buy-in from the people, you know, at the top of the hierarchy saying, this is how we run things. Um, and then back then this was like, a, I've. I practically finished my PhD around 2015, and then I officially graduated in 2016. Uh, it was, um, you know, the, the, the tech culture in in the Premier League in the, in, in England, it wasn't that tech friendly. Uh, so there were conversations, but it wasn't the best place for a data scientist to be, as in you were like a third class citizen. So I still I kept doing work in sports, <laughs> like in other areas, like sports betting or. I worked for a couple of years uh, in a company that was dealing with um, essentially valuation models for players, but taking into account their social activity and their and their football skill and things like that. But I never really worked in with a football team directly, right? For this particular reason. However, wh who my boss at that time, Wayne Diesel, uh, who maybe, I hope he's listening to the show. Like, if, if he's listening, you know, feel free to ping me on LinkedIn. We haven't spoken in years. Uh, he moved from the Premier League. To, to the US and he did a stint in the NFL 
And then uh, in the NBA, so I think it was Miami Dolphins and then some NBA team. Uh, so I haven't spoken to him for a while, but uh, I was very surprised because uh, I'm a member of the Royal Statistical Society, and the Royal Statistical Society and the American Statistical Association, they have a journal called Significance. Um, and uh, in that journal, um, Wayne actually wrote an article talking about the work he was doing in sports analytics in the U.S., and all of these things were essentially the work that we started in Tottenham, right? And he carried it forward, um, which was very exciting. But obviously the difference is that uh, Wayne Diesel is a um, you know, medical practitioner and a physio practitioner, so he was the head of the medical team. Um, so it's different when he's like, oh, this is how we run things uh, compared you know, to my situation where when essentially I finished my PhD, I was like a junior uh, data scientist, <laughs> right? And it's one more reason that pushed me towards the startups because I realized that, uh, <clears throat> again, in startups, you can make like a big difference with your knowledge. Like you can come up with an algorithm or give them a direction, which maybe a few years later, they end up raising uh, like 10 millions in, in funding, in Series A or, or whatever. In a football team, you're not the one who's actually going to to make that difference. It's a, yeah, it's a different game. <laughs> and, and I guess also I, I can I can relate to that, right? Uh, UK football versus American sports. Uh, American is very stats driven, right? Mm. Uh, well, and I remember in, in, in the UK and Europe, they were all protesting about VAR, if you're familiar with it, right? Where, where yeah. you take like, the organic nature out of it, right? So you see these two different mindsets, really. And I can, I can 100% relate to what you're saying. Yeah. Um, now, you're, 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 you're basically doing a lot of things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, from Web3 to AI to data science to advisory and, and much, much more writing books. Um, is that by design? Is that how you'd like to, do you like to balance things out and have your tentacles spread across? Yes, I'm, I'm one of those people that fo f started following a portfolio career because before such a thing had a name. When uh, simply because I realized that I, I was trying to figure out um, what to do, right? Because I finished my PhD and I really had a very strong academic background. And then I'm like, oh, I'm quitting academia as a full-time job. And then I started working for a startup full-time. And I'm like, oh, I'm not really motivated with this either. And, and then I started talking to different people, advising different companies. And then opportunities suddenly, suddenly started you know, showing up. And I got used to working in this kind of way like for years uh, with d different projects, different people, until I realized that, okay, maybe I'm spread out too thin, right? So, so there's obviously, they can be too much of a good thing, which is essentially you can't really push anything forward because you're spread out too thin. And, and that's when I realized, okay, I need to essentially keep this portfolio career, but do it in a bit more structured way, which is uh, where I currently uh, stand. And I also make sure that the things I'm doing, they all like, have a common theme. So for example, Tesseract Academy is uh, data science education for executives and consulting for companies, right? Then Beyond Machine is data science education for those who want to become uh, data scientists. I work in Web3, but I work in token economics, which is essentially data science and economics, right? So, uh, and my books, they're all about data science. Uh, so I'm involved in all these different things, but I realized one way to make this work is to just marry everything under um, one theme and make sure that, um, you know, they somehow fit into each other. They're not just random. So it's not like I also run an e-commerce store and I sell protein powders, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Excellent. Be being entrepreneurs ourselves, Stelios, you know, talking, you, you mentioned Tesseract Academy and you specialize in, you know, educating decision makers or executives uh, in, in, uh, about data science. What, what inspired you to start your company? Uh, I just saw the need for it, to be honest with you, because uh, when, I, when I was working on my PhD in Tottenham, um, I was under the illusion that being um, very proficient at the technical level uh, was actually what would make the difference and then uh, I was you know that that PhD was essentially the first time I had interacted with a proper big company right I was doing some freelancing but with startups etc and then I realized the importance of cultural factors within an organization and it was the first time this hit me in the face that uh, an organization is an entity with very complex human relationships and rules 
Um, and this can be different from one company to another, from one country to another, from a sector to another. It's, it's a very, 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 very complicated problem. Um, and somehow in my head, I, I thought this goes, which is a, a very common misconception for many people that have a technical background. Uh, they think all these matters like they're just fluffy and they're, they're still fluffy, but they're super important. <laughs> it's just that they're difficult to define because they're so intangible and, and human and fluid. And I spent, let's say, three or four years uh, where on one hand I had a university that because it's an elite UK university, I had to do some kind of innovative research to publish it because otherwise you can get published. And then an organization that wanted something much simpler and the main problem lied not in the models, but in the culture. Uh, and after like four years of doing this, I'm like, actually, that's a more general problem. Uh, and I started running some workshops in London and I saw people started joining those workshops where I would explain data science and AI, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that went well. Uh, and then at some point, like COVID happened and I'm like, oh, maybe I can actually try to turn this into a, into a proper company because I realized that um, for better or for worse, even if data science now is more mature, is more accepted, um, developments like ChatGPT have helped break AI into the mainstream, I see that um, there's still um, challenges uh, in you know, how data science and AI is being perceived. And I think that's going to stay there for a while, because even if these technologies, they get, you know, they get adopted by everyone, um, I think that those professionals that don't have a technical background, they will still need to at least invest a little bit of time to get a basic understanding of um, you know, of, of data science and AI. And this is what really motivated me. I mean, I basically I saw the need and then I received feedback because, you know, I started the workshops, then from the workshops I wrote the book, I received positive feedback from that. And, uh, you know, one, th one thing led to another. Excellent. And and would like to ask you a lot of questions. You mentioned culture. I want to go a little bit deeper into that and even on, on AI and data science. But before we go there, right, we always find it useful for our listeners to, to hear your definition of concepts and how you look at these things, right? So mm -hmm. um, before we go a little bit deeper, how would you distinguish data science from AI? Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, well, AI as a term, originated in 1956 in, in the US and it was a joint effort by certain academics, like I think from Carnegie Mellon and IBM and maybe MIT, uh, to recreate intelligence, right, in a machine. And back then AI, essentially it was a very specific vision and a very specific approach. And now the vision is still there, but the approach keeps changing. Um, data science is a term that originated, I mean, it, it has been around since the 70s, but it really took off as a term around 15 years ago. Um, and it's a term created for marketing purposes. So around the turn of the millennium, uh, we saw advancements which played a key role in the development of data science. And these were primarily uh, the rise of the internet worldwide, social media, cloud computing, cheaper storage, where essentially many companies found themselves collecting all sorts of data and having no idea what to do with it. And then like big consultancies, because they, quite often as many of these terms, they start from big companies, they realize that, you know, that's like actually a huge market and companies were asking for this. So this is when we saw the terms big data and data science being used a lot. And this term came about because until that point, uh, if you look into the history of data science, uh, you'll see a bunch of disjoint efforts in different fields to analyze and extract patterns from data in different ways. So if you study the history, this is what my last book actually talks about, because there's a history of doing this since the Middle Ages, um, which then has taken very different forms. Okay, There have been many, many theories as to how to um, analyze data, create intelligence, this, that. And again, many of them were disjoined because, let's not forget, and forget your listeners, that's not a given, that the internet has been a staple in our lives only in the very recent history. So when I, the, when I first joined university, it was 2004, and still the majority of students, at least in Greece, were going to the libraries. So, and you were like, oh, maybe I can Google something, but it wasn't the first thing that would come to your mind. Uh, most people didn't have a smartphone. I think iPhone came out like around those years, right? And it wasn't necessarily affordable for everyone, uh, which means that maybe you had someone in a university coming up with something and then someone else coming up with something similar in a different continent, yeah? Um, 
And essentially, the term data science uh, brought all these different um, areas together. It's something I also talk about in my, in my book and in my workshops where I demystify this term. And so instead, because before that you had people saying, oh, I'm doing data mining, I'm doing computational intelligence. And uh, in the 90s, maybe you'd have a master's in neural networks, like, and the neural networks fell out of favor and they were called something else. Yeah. And obviously this creates a very fragmented picture, which is difficult to sell. So when I started my PhD in 2012, uh, hardcore academics, like from the old disciplines, like uh, statistics, for example, they would say, oh, data science as a term, it's offensive because, you know, we've been doing these things for like 200 years and now they're rebranding it. Uh, but I mean, when, when any, anything that moves out of academia and goes into, let's say, the, <clears throat> like the economy and um, and the real world, in a way, has to be more marketable. And uh, for better or for worse, data science was the term that was used, which is a bit funny because, um, I mean, salary-wise, maybe this is still the case. You can have someone who has studied statistics, and then they also, you know, they can learn a bit more coding and call themselves data scientists. And maybe this person will have a higher salary than someone who is like, oh, I'm a statistician, even if the background is more or less the same. So this can, I'm not saying this is always the case, but it can happen. And it's just the way that the market thinks. Uh, however, I think because AI sounds cooler as a term, we're gonna see it being used and abused more often. But in reality, many of the companies that say I'm doing AI, they're just doing data science. And data science, um, Usually in, in practice, it, it means one of three things is some companies they're simply doing dashboards because that's all they need and that's all they understand. Then in the majority of cases, it's machine learning, uh, which is a particular field, a particular instantiation of AI. And in some cases, it is statistics rebranded. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then maybe companies which are more conscious, they do like a mix of all those things and they actually know where, where they're heading to. But it's a lot of play on words um, and uh, <laughs> deliberate confusion. I say deliberate because I think like service providers actually try to, to promote these terms, sometimes even abuse them. Yeah. So in many cases, you could use them interchangeably at this stage. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the, yeah, the thing is that, uh, that uh, like in general technology, not just, I mean, uh, maybe this will change in the future if things get regulated, um, but it, it's not like medicine. That's uh, what I call a high responsibility field where if you make a mistake, someone dies. In most cases in technology, you know, this is not happening, which means that there are no regulatory bodies, no professional qualifications, everything is moving very fast and service providers, products, startups, bigger companies, whatever, uh, they, they just try to use these terms in whatever way they can to get business, um, which is a bit funny, but I think that's the best analogy I can find because I'm like, imagine if we live in, a, in some parallel reality, medicine was like this and someone could come up with new medical terms uh, all of a sudden and say, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and then they actually harm people. Uh, that's the situation in data science, the difference being that the substance doesn't really change and they're not harming people. Um, it, it's just about improving the marketability of the terms. <laughs> that's all. Probably, probably with technology, if you make a mistake, then a couple of brain cells die. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's just about it. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a funny world, um, and, and I think we've seen a lot of this now recently, uh, AI data science aside in, in the Silicon Valley and, and the layoffs. Um, I think uh, this kind of mentality has essentially uh, helped inflated valuations and overhiring, which then these companies are like, oh, maybe not the opportunity to lay off some employees, right? Uh, it's... Uh, it feels like sometimes, I don't know, for some of those companies, it feels it's very difficult to be honest, like you have to oversell everything. Um, maybe it's, I don't know, part of the Silicon Valley model. Well, that's a very big conversation, um, but it's how things are, <laughs> for better or for worse. And maybe talking a little bit more about data science and, and AI, yeah, let's, let's call it one bigger category and maybe even stats, right? Mm. Um, especially with ChatGPT, right? Now it's, it's I mean, I, I, I can see like a big shift almost. Like there was a lot of talk about AI, I don't know, three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. And then everything was blockchain and then Web3. But since ChatGPT, everything is AI again, right? Mm. Um, where do you see, and maybe let, let's talk about, where do you see AI evolving in the next two, three, or maybe five years? 
How fast do you think it will now evolve, given it has gone completely mainstream? Yeah, I think it's going to evolve very fast uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that there's going to be more investment flowing into it uh, because we're going to transition from big data and glorified dashboards to actual AI. Some, I mean, it's, it's a bit primitive in the sense that it's not like, uh, you know, Terminator level AI, but it's still some sort of artificial intelligence. Uh, and at the same time, it looks like we've cracked the code in certain things. So, for example, ChatGPT is not using any kind of novel methodology. It's just using existing algorithms combined in a very nice way and, in, um, and with lots of data behind it. Uh, so, which means that we're going to see further advances without us having to wait for some kind of insane breakthrough. Um, at the same time, computers will keep getting more powerful. Um, you know, memories will keep, in, keep increasing. Computer memory, maybe we'll see quantum computers being you know, usable in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, who knows. Um, so that's only going to increase. Uh, now, how AI is going to be used uh, by society, by companies, that's a different matter altogether. Uh, ChatGPT is a very particular type of AI for particular applications. Um, so it looks like the the companies that own these algorithms they want to essentially commoditize them to, to to the extent that they can simply because that's a better business model it remains to be seen you know how the space will evolve i expect that in terms of data science per se uh, this will you know data science will still be around simply because most companies the, the value they can extract from data simply revolves around you know cleaning up the data and doing some visualizations building some basic models not necessarily around AI per se, but as AI keeps improving and you know gets more and more commoditized, I would expect in the future that maybe companies would lay off half their marketing department because they can do creatives like in a better way through uh, artificial intelligence. It's a very big conversation trying to figure out what which jobs are a threat or not, and which jobs are going to be enhanced. So, for example, software development. Um, are they going to completely be replaced by AI? Maybe in some cases, I, I still don't know. Um, it remains to be seen. Even though I think everyone's surprised that um, AI, it seems that the first victims of AI um, and automation uh, are the creatives because everyone was always saying, oh, it's actually human creativity. You know, a machine can never achieve this. It's going to be like simpler tasks which AI will automate. Surprisingly, uh, it looks like what we've nailed is human language, which was considered the most difficult you know, thing to master, mm -hmm. and obviously image generation. And I guess there's a good reason for that. I think it's because in language, as well as images, uh, in the majority of applications, they're like just fluff. As in, uh, you know, if you look into most blog posts of the internet, especially like copywriting, um, it's not anything substantial, as in, it's not like a mathematical proof. Uh, it's the same with images. You can you can create a nice image, but it's not like a diagram that an architect would create. And if it's incorrect, then the house is going to come crashing down. So there's lots of so even though it's difficult to master the rules of grammar and syntax, um, I think there's, a, there's lots of flexibility in terms of expressing something and then a human perceiving this as correct or yeah, okay, it's, it's just more one more opinion or or whatever. And I think this is why this type of uh, creativity was replicated by AI quite successfully. Now, what I think might be more difficult to do and remains to be seen is more specialized creativity, the kind of thing that very few people like Steve Jobs was able to do, to say, oh, that's my vision for Apple. I see this device. I'm going to come this part. You know, that, that's something which is very difficult because it requires an understanding of you know, society and the current trends, plus have a very wide view. Um, I'm not sure how that would go. I guess these are like kind of unanswered questions and speculation. But I guess there are not that many play people to replace of that caliber. That's true. <laughs> that <is> true. Yeah. <laughs> there are maybe 10 in the world right now. Yeah, it's like um, saying I want I'd to... Like to... <laughs> no, I was going to say it's like saying uh, so... oh, I want an AI that can play basketball like Michael Jordan or, you know, LeBron James. It's Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're not looking for this so... kind of dexterity in, in robotics. Correct. Yeah. 
it doesn't need to scale. Yeah. Um, a couple of so I want to combine a couple of topics that you that you just mentioned. So that was great. So your view on the future of AI and and jobs and all that. Uh, you also earlier mentioned culture and companies. Right, and how that's evolving. Mm -hmm. No, no, just a bit of a background. Mangta started because of the pandemic, uh, because we saw the shift in mindset culture around remote work. Mm -hmm. And that's something we really wanted to, to make more reliable and less of the Wild West, right? Mm -hmm. Now, here's a question, and, and I don't know if you have an opinion on this. How do you feel like, not, not just taking away jobs, but more of enhancing, what will be the role of AI and data science in the field of a remote workforce, do you feel that, that in the space of, of talent acquisition, uh, talent vetting, uh, people joining new organizations in a remote manner, do you feel there's a, AI will play a big role in the near term future? Yeah, I think it can definitely enhance remote work in a few different ways. I mean, look, the main ways that uh, the reason to be in an office in a company, there, there might be a few reasons, but I think the main one is to build a culture. The second one is that I think offices are more useful for junior employees that require constant feedback and quite often constant supervision. Yeah. Um, so if you have um, an AI that can actually, is, you know, is advanced, uh, as in it can you know, write, for example, text to the level that you desire, that you need it right, in terms of copywriting, or it can evaluate how good, you know, a piece of text is for a particular application. If you have this, then this kind of supervision can actually be replaced by an AI. So the cultural element is going to still be there. But where I'm going with this is that maybe when you have someone working in a country and English is not the first language, and then they use, for example, an AI to produce a piece of text. And then there's, let's say, another algorithm which gives them feedback as to how this closely resonates with you know, what they need to produce according to some guidelines. And this can speed up this feedback and training process. Yeah. Um, and I'm not talking about replacing, I'm talking about improving. It's the same with junior coders. Uh, I think that AI could actually help improve their quality of the code. So instead of maybe code reviews can take place more automatic in an automated fashion. Um, these are like some of the thoughts I have, but obviously the, the, the interesting thing is that giving this type of feedback um, is probably more difficult than what ChatGPT is doing now because ChatGPT is good with very open-ended stuff like, oh, tell me about this or produce some code. And it's like, oh, it produces some code. When you have something which has to be evaluated with stricter criteria, uh, there's still work we need to do. Uh, but probably eventually it's going to get there. And uh, yes, I do help that. The, I do think this is going to help with remote working. And I guess this is also um, is the wider field of education because now what we're talking about is learning and receiving feedback. Uh, this you know this can happen on all levels of a company in terms of training, and maybe even in higher education eventually or university yeah university education in in general. Um, who knows? But I think it's it's going to happen. Yeah, and, and, and I have so many more questions to ask. <laughs> but I also want to talk very specifically on the philosophy of the mind. Uh, mm. I want to go a little bit there, if, if I may later, even talking in, talk in economics. And I know that, that we're running out of time. Mm. I do want to have one last question on AI. What worries you about AI? Mm. Good question. I think what worries me is that we don't know what it's going to look like in five or ten years from now. There's speculation, but no convincing answer. Um, and I mean, and I say we don't know what it's going to look like. It's we don't really know what the impact of it is going to be on society. Uh, I hear many people talking with conviction that yes, it's going to replace jobs, and we're going to have some kind of universal basic income. Um, I don't know, or whether there will be like new job. Um, but we also don't know. We know it's going to get better. We don't know how much better it's going to be. Um, and I think this uncertainty is something that worries me in the sense that I don't feel the current systems that we have in place in terms of government, policy, regulation uh, are ready for this kind of change and at that pace. And I think we got a taste of how inefficient the systems are with blockchain, uh, which has been the hottest technology since, you know, since uh, the big data craze. Uh, and you see how, how fast crypto has developed and how slow governments have been to do anything. Uh, if anything, they're just, you know, uh, being reactive, uh, they're not being proactive. And I'm afraid this, this might eventually happen with AI. We might see AI being used in all sorts of ways, and then uh, the government will try to do, you know, to, to, uh, things 
after they to fix things after something has happened, and it's probably going to be too little, too late. Um, so it remains to be seen. Um, and yeah, I guess we could be talking about this for hours because like there are many angles to it, from uh, data ethics to AI ethics. Um, to how this is going to affect the economy, to whether universal basic income is sustainable or even desirable. Uh, there are also, and, and also some of those questions, they're not just technical. Some of them are philosophical in nature or ideological. Like, I believe society should function in this way. Like, let me give you an example. So, we, I believe that it's, it's likely that China might get ahead of the U.S. and the Western world in general in the AI race, simply because of their very lax regulations around uh, data and how AI is being used, okay? Is this something desirable, yes or no? And, and you see there also questions there that take into account the possibility of a third world war. Like, oh, if, if you know, maybe we want to have better you know, data standards and ethics around data, but if, for example, China becomes a superior um, you know, power compared to the US and its allies, um, do, you know, do we actually believe that we can sustain our standard of living and our way of living in face of such a threat? Or maybe China is not really a threat, maybe you know, it's someone we should collaborate to. And so this extends beyond data science, beyond AI, into the realm of policy, politics, um, you know, what perception society will have of, you know, how we see essentially our future, like globalization now is shifting gear more to, towards localization. And uh, I think we're going to hear like many opinions over the next, you know, the next few years. On a wider scale, I believe that societies and countries that manage to navigate this landscape better, they're going to find themselves uh, in a much better position. Uh, but I guess getting it right takes a combination of you know, determination, leadership, vision, and probably some luck, uh, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> and talking about reactive regulations and policy, uh, let's go a little bit about uh, Web3, right? Um, you mentioned token economics uh, and auditing uh, these type of systems, right? Which is clearly absolutely necessary given what's happening and what has happened. Um, very quickly for, for everyone, so how would you define token economics? And, and uh, tell us a little bit more about auditing um, all of this and what you would typically audit? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so token economics uh, is simply the study of token economies, where token economies as an economy based on a blockchain, where the currency used is a block blockchain-based currency and not a fiat currency per se. And the difference between token economics and fiat economics is that fiat economics are controlled by central banks, whereas blockchain token economics they're controlled by a particular entity, whether it's a centralized company or a decentralized, like a DAO. And the incentive structures in that particular economy, <coughs> they're arbitrary in the sense that they're decided by the company or the community. Yeah. So that's like the very general description. Now, the goal of, a token econ of studying token economics and modeling them is to make sure that uh, the economy created by the token uh, facilitates uh, the goals that this particular company is going to achieve, which again, it's a bit open-ended because there's so many different use cases. For example, if you, are, if you create a stable coin, then what you are aiming to do is maintain a peg. Uh, if you create a borrowing and lending platform, then your goal is to match borrowers and lenders and minimize risk or maybe maximize returns. There might be different principles at play depending on your priorities and the risk profile of your users. At the token economy, has to align with those objectives because otherwise, for example, as we saw with Terra Luna, it aligned with those objectives up to a point. Uh, it, the, the design had certain flaws and when there were some you know, external factors, then it, it came crashing down. And this is where auditing comes in play. So auditing, it's funny because I stumbled upon token economics out of personal interest because I was in love with agent-based modeling and it's something I never really got to apply in my career. And then when tokenomics became a thing, I'm like, hey, all these tools I've been using, they can be applied here. So I started writing about this. So there was very little conversation about analyzing tokenomics in 2017. And then startups started reaching out to me because of that. So then I'm like, okay, yeah, I can help you with that. So then I started doing more and more research and work in this area. Um, and then agent-based modeling became a thing. And two years ago, I was contacted by a stablecoin back X saying, hey, I need, I need someone to, to, to audit our design. And 
then another company called Algem, uh, .io, asked me to do the same for their, it's a DeFi um, protocol, liquid lending, asked me to do the same. And that's when I realized that in 2017 and 18, I was mostly being contacted by startup founders who wanted to create something from scratch. And now, because the, the sophistication and the complexity has increased, I was being contacted a lot by companies that had set something up, but this had reached, the, the economy had reached a level of complexity. They felt they can no longer <clears throat> like understand themselves. They needed like an external, um, you know, essentially partner, someone with an independent view to uh, to really say, yeah, I mean, this is, there are some weak points here, or there's some things we can improve upon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I found myself essentially moving from doing the design from you know zero to to from A to B. Uh, to just taking a token economy and saying, look, these are the weak points, and these are the strong points, we can, you know, we can make some improvements, so then it becomes more robust. And I realized that other people started talking about this theme, yeah? And that's when I'm like, okay, probably we need to try and formalize this process, because after what happened with Terra Luna, with FTX, we need to have some kind of standard uh, with eventual goal in 10 years or so, uh, that tokenomics are going to be audited, you know, in, in the similar way to which, let's say, an entity like PwC might audit the accounts of a big corporation, and this might be a legal requirement in, in the future. And that's why I also recently joined Hacken and we started the um, tokenomics auditing team. And essentially, our goal behind tokenomics auditing is to first and foremost make sure that the token economy is robust and achieves the goals that the founders claim it's going to achieve, then improve it if those goals are not achieved, and then finally give a, a score similar to the scores that are given by credit rating agencies so that the users can make an informed decision. And I think this is where most of the complexity lies in, because if you look into Terra Luna again, which I think is the most famous example of a big product crashing in recent history, other than FTX, but FTX was an exchange, which also required auditing, but not mostly for its account, not so much its economics. Um, Terra Luna was a good design with certain flaws. So the rating wouldn't be a triple A, yeah, but it wouldn't be a triple C. So it worked well under certain conditions. And this is a thing where many users, many retail investors or high net worth investors, um, this is where they find it difficult to wrap their hands around because in, it's, like, it, it's like the real economy. Like the real economy works well under certain conditions and takes a lot of effort <clears throat> in fine tuning to make things operate smoothly. And I think the current situation we live in with inflation, with the stimulus, with interest rates demonstrates this. And now talking economics, the whole field has found itself in a similar level of complexity where <clears throat> It's not a black or like you know it's, it's not black or white. It's it's mostly a gray area, and this is why we need to formalize this. So it's so auditing token economies and assigning a risk score stops being the matter of subjective opinion, and there is at least an element of objectivity. Yeah, and this is really one of our principles. And I hope that I mean in the next few months I, I've sent the paper, I submitted it. Um, I'm planning to publish in the Journal of the British Blockchain Association uh, the first guidelines for tokenomics auditing, which I'm not claiming is the end-all be-all, and I don't expect the guidelines to stay the same in five years, uh, but we need to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my thesis. That's phenomenal, and I, would, I, I wish we had a lot more time. I would like to cover the, the key topics of, of, of audits, the, the audit, right, and, and what are the key components. By the way, uh, I did a, part two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I did a thesis, thesis on distributed uh, systems and, and agent-based modeling. So I have many, many more questions on that for you. But again, uh, there's a much bigger question I'd like to ask as my final one, Jackie, I promise. Um, and that is, I like to go full circle, mm -hmm. right? You started with the philosophy of the mind, mm -hmm. right? You moved into, let's say, data science, AI, which are kind of replicating human minds to a certain extent, or at least aspire to, right? As you've been on this journey, what have you really learned uh, from that angle, from a philosophy of the mind angle, uh, since you made that shift? Ah, that's actually a great question. Um, what I've learned, and this might come to the surprise of many listening to this, is that while the mind is very complex, it's actually much simpler than we thought it is. Um, so don't forget my first degree was in cognitive psychology, and I had also some basic training in clinical psychology, psychoanalysis, etc. And 
for, for centuries, we had different models of the mind and the psyche and emotions, wh whatever word you want to use for any of those entities. Um, and I mean, if, if you also take into account uh, religions and religious history, this, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, theories that extend for thousands of years, you know, into human history, trying to understand the human mind. And yes, humans are very complex uh, and in, in some cases unpredictable, um, but essentially all these theories, they try to put humans into some kind of box. And I think with the rise of data and also the rise of the internet, which has seen us like interacting online, like many different people from like all over the world constantly, we've accumulated lots of data points and data which then gave rise to things like chat GPT, right? And these things act like as a mirror, you know, for ourselves. And, uh, and again, you know, again, using the chat GPT example and the example of language, many have realized that maybe humans, at least in some aspects, are not as complicated as we thought they are. Or maybe the human mind, yes, it's wonderful, but maybe it's limited. Um, maybe it's something we can actually replicate. And I, I think we witness this paradigm shift from, um, I think in culture as well, as in if you look many movies in, in the 90s, uh, like about the narrative of how amazing it is to be human and, you know, Terminator and this and that, there was lots of conversation around there about computers and AI and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, how in a way humans are something different. And I think we're kind of reaching a different narrative now uh, because we now we have, uh, you know, new generations which are digital natives and then the generations after them are going to be AI natives. So I think in two, three generations from now, we, humans will be like, oh, actually AI is smarter than us <laughs> in, in many different ways and can do things better than we do. At, uh, that's like a surprising conclusion for myself as someone who originally in his career, even though I'm not doing this now, let's say as a researcher in a professional capacity, I was determined to try and find out, to unlock the, the you know, secrets of the human mind. But one thing that um, definitely the original visionaries of AI and cognitive science got correct is that the best way to study the human mind, it seems, was to essentially try to study like the different functions because if you go 70 years into the past you'll see that cognitive science with neuroscience with ai with computer science they had many synergies and that's why again if you study things like linguistics and you see chomsky's like theories about the the human language uh, he borrowed many things for, from computer science and this kind of thinking now it's a given and essentially breaking things down um, has helped us understand them and this has been something very, um, very fascinating for me. And uh, again, there's another probably like example I can, I can mention here. I, I was reading this a few years ago uh, when things like Transformers first came out, like not the, um, not the robots, the, <laughs> the neural networks that uh, ChatGPT is based upon. And I remember reading a quote that, you know, before deep neural networks, uh, companies that wanted to use um, to develop langu natural language applications, uh, they would often hire computational linguists and linguists, etc. And I remember a quote by someone saying that every time I fire a linguist, it seems like the performance of my model increases. And that's funny because we had humans in the whole field of study of the human language, and then we have an algorithm that just reads uh, Wikipedia articles, and then it can just learn the rules of syntax and grammar without any external help. And that's probably another insight that um, maybe like the level of complexity of things like language is probably too high for, let's say, individuals to just craft rules and teach this to a machine. Uh, but it seems that we've been successful enough in using clever algorithms with insane amounts of data to replicate the functionalities of the human mind. Um, now, I don't want to go too philosophical and start talking about, you know, whether robots have emotions and all that, because I think these debates are a bit fake and superficial most of the time. I think the most interesting debate around this area is around the functionalities, because I don't think anyone believes that ChatGPT uh, has emotions or, or anything of that kind, even if, you know, the answers are, are very intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, then, then you can go and debate what is an emotion really and, and, you know, and then maybe it becomes a gray area, right? I don't know. Not necessarily so. <laughs> I think it's a fascinating topic. Yeah, no, but you know what? I, th Sorry? I think that's a question of what is consciousness and the thing unless you take a very abstract philosophical type of stance. Uh, we know that consciousness is a property of living organisms. They need to have some kind of, ner you know, nervous system. 
so we definitely know that the computer cannot have like emotions. Now, there might be some arguments against this thesis, uh, as in whether there can be things without the neural system that have consciousness. Um, you know, there was this theory that maybe the Earth is conscious and whatnot, or whether there are creatures, which like viruses, which again, they seem to have some kind of intelligence, maybe on the collective level, but they, uh, but they don't have a nervous system and they might be intelligent, um, and, and things like that. It gets a bit too philosophical at that point, but I like to be a bit pragmatic. It's, it's one more thing I didn't like in academia, at least in that particular area, that I'm like, okay, in the end of the day, does this really affect our lives? And the thing with AI and large language models is like, oh, is it really going to take my job? Or is it going to help my company? Is it going to affect the economy in a positive or negative way? Um, you know, whereas like debating about how it feels <laughs> about answering questions, it's probably a bit pointless <laughs> given everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, you know, with the AI not being capable of uh, any emotion, Dr. Stelios, we love how passionate you sound and uh, your passion about this field. So it's it's very it's very nice to to see you talk about your passions today. And it's very romantic how you said you fell in love with agent-based modeling. <laughs> well, that, coming from somebody that actually loves op Optimus Prime from the yeah, Transformers. Yeah. Did you see her eyes? Did you see her eyes go up when you say Transformers? Yeah. <laughs> no, I like Transformers as well as a kid, but I was referring to the new. Well, AI practitioners have emotions in contrast to AI creations. So, you know, maybe add this in the notes as well. <laughs> yes. It's going to be long, <laughs> long notes. Uh, Let's not let for... uh, describe that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was just feed it. <laughs> now, for, for organizations or businesses interested in connecting with you, Stelios, where can they best find you or how can they uh, best get in touch with you? Yeah, uh, that's easy. Um, first of all, there's my personal website, the datascientist.com. Uh, that we have plans this year we're going to turn it into a publication so we're also accepting guest articles featured articles on topics relating to ai data science technology and web3 uh, that's one the data scientist.com then tesseract academy that's tesseract with double s dot academy and then uh, finally if you want to become a data scientist uh, check out beyond machine it's beyond um, slash uh, machine.com uh, i guess all this information will be in the notes and i'm always happy to connect to to people on linkedin absolutely just make sure to, to to add the note saying you you know you listen to this podcast because i receive like a million invites a day and uh, sometimes it's like random people on linkedin <laughs> <laughs> so it's just good you know if i know you <laughs> actually at least listen to this uh, podcast and you're not just a random person on the internet <laughs> thank you <laughs> Absolutely, and your books you can definitely find it on on, on your Amazon. Website. Yeah, you Google my name. Available on Amazon. Yeah, it's, it's the decision yeah, makers' handbook uh, for data science and then business model in emerging technologies. I have an Amazon author account, so if you Google my name, Kampakis uh, Stilianos Kampakis on Amazon, you'll find them. A uh, third book called Uncertainty should be coming out uh, this summer. Uh, it depends a bit on my publisher and their you know their timelines. Fantastic. So uh, it's a wrap for today's episode of Mangtas Nation. Thank you so much, Dr. Stelios, for taking the time to be with us today. And uh, to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and learned a lot of things. Definitely check out our show notes, our lengthy show notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything will be listed down there. And uh, we promise to be back next time with another great episode doctor thank you once again thank you it was a pleasure thank you now once again this is jackie de Manc. and wouter del Barre. stay tuned for the next episode of mangdas nation thank you for tuning in to mangdas nation mangdas your curated marketplace for b2b outsourcing solutions follow our social media pages to know more about us Sign up as a client or sign up as a vendor and be part of this global B2B marketplace. Join us at www.mangtas.com. <laughs>